software developer at the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, for those of you, or DPLA for short, um, those of you who don't know what DPLA is, uh, we are a national aggregator of cultural heritage metadata held across repositories uh, throughout the United States. So we aggregate content from uh, libraries, archives, museums. We're fairly agnostic about what we, what we collect from these institutions. And today we're providing about access to about 30 million items from 3,000 contributing institutions uh, across the United States. Uh, I want to acknowledge one quick thing. Um, most of you probably don't know. Um, the last week has been a kind of difficult one for DPLA. Um, as of today, we are letting six of our staff members go, a number of whom have made substantial contributions to the work I'm going to show here today. So, you know, I want to acknowledge from the outset that this is not my work. This is the work of the entire team, and you know, a number of those individuals are um, no longer here. So, please just keep that in mind as I'm, as I'm going through this, this slide deck here. Uh, so, I mentioned metadata aggregation a couple of times. Um, without a doubt, you all have systems in your own institutions that do similar kinds of things, uh, but for DPLA, it means uh, four key things. Uh, and we're currently on our third iteration of a metadata aggregation system, or uh, you'll hear me use the uh, term ingestion system. Ingestion, metadata aggregation, interchangeable, but uh, it means that the system does four key things. We gotta collect our data from our partners, so we need to harvest that data. Uh, we collect data from a variety of institutions, which means that it comes to us uh, a variety of ways. OAI PMH, Resource Sync, Bespoke APIs, file exports, including JSON, XML, and even CSV exports. And so we are pulling data from a lot of different places. Uh, next, it's gotta be transformed and normalized into DPLA's local schema uh, called DPLA Map, and if we're collecting from a diverse group of institutions. It's coming to us as Dublin Core, Qualified Dublin Core, MARC, MODS, um, you know, bespoke schemas, and of course, a CSV file. Uh, after it's normalized into DPLA, uh, uh, DPLA's model, we apply a number of both normalizations and qualitative improvements to that data. So, you know, string normalization uh, to adding lat-long coordinates, uh, reconciling language to the ISO 639 standard forms, uh, working with uh, the EDTF date format uh, as well, and a number of other enrichments. Lastly, we gotta get the data out. Typically, that takes the form of exporting to a search index, either Elasticsearch or Solar, but it also includes exporting to uh, you know, a bulk download format uh, like uh, JSON-LD. So, regardless of the iteration of our ingestion system that I'm talking about, every single one of them does all four of those, those four key things. Uh, to back up a little bit, um, so DPLA is a relatively new organization. Uh, it was conceived in 2010, formally launched in 2013, uh, providing access to 2.4 million items. Uh, in, that kind of, in, the, in that very early startup phase, uh, the organization recognized uh, the need to kind of you know, build the second iteration. They, uh, they identified a number of opportunities to improve, uh, as well as some deficiencies in the system. And so they began work on uh, I'm going to call it Ingestion 2. It has other formal names, but for the sake of clarity, Ingestion 2. Uh, and they began work on that in 2015, and it was eventually put into production um, uh, late 2015. And so when I say put into production, it was put into production in parallel with the original ingestion system. So we were running two aggregation systems in parallel, migrating one partner, you know, one partner at a time over. Because at the time, I think we had uh, probably about 25 or 30 partners and each one has specific metadata mappings that need to get rewritten um, and quality control needs to be done on each of them. And so that's where we were uh, in the spring of 2016 when I joined the organization was they were going full bore into migrating people from one system over to the other. Um, ingestion 2 stack. Uh, don't want to dwell a lot on this, but there are a couple of things that are really worth pointing out. Um, it was a Ruby on Rails application or you know, an underpinning uh, a Rails engine that underpinned everything. Uh, Cree Cree is the formal name of the product. The biggest distinguishing factor, however, is that it took a linked data first approach to metadata aggregation, and there is a lot to unpack with that statement that is outside the scope of this presentation. But the, the biggest flag I wanna draw your attention to is that it, every interaction, every call, every mapping operation happened over HTTP. So you've got an underlying database, Postgres, and then a layer above that called Apache Marmata that is a, an 
LDP layer or a linked data protocol layer that handles those HTTP interactions between uh, Marmata and the Rails application. And so when you go to make a, like, when you go to map a record, one record, that's a series of HTTP calls back and forth. And Marmata then has to query the triple store or update the triple store alongside of that. So there are many, many pieces of interaction um, that are going on there. I'm going <laughs> to skip my Grace Hopper anecdote for time, but if you don't know who Grace Hopper is, look her up. She is fantastic, was fantastic, excuse me, she's passed. Um, uh, just a huge pioneer in early programming and has a great anecdote about um, nanoseconds. So anyway, uh, in 2016, as we were migrating people and institutions into this uh, new triple store, of course, the triple store is growing in size. What that means is a, the, the queries to the triple store take longer. It takes longer to traverse the graph as it grows. That results, you kind of, we reached a point in the size of the triple store where jobs would start to time out because it took too long to traverse and get results back from, uh, from Marmata, and so the HTTP call would time out and the Rails application would just you know, report back, oh yeah, this job failed because you know, an HTTP timeout error. At the beginning, it wasn't a huge deal because they were fairly infrequent and you just had to start the job over and it would more than likely succeed on the second try. But as the graph grew and grew and grew, those problems became more frequent and um, really started to impact our process. Uh, last point, when a job fails, it doesn't restart from failure. You have to restart from the beginning. So if you fail mapping record 350,000 to 400,000, you start over on one. So this is where the team spent a good deal of our time over the summer, was really trying to patch these holes. Um, again, I don't want to go into each one of the, the, the strategies that we tried, but about four-fifths of the team were spending 80 to 100% of their time you know, trying to find ways to mitigate these underlying fundamental constraints of the system. Uh, eventually, our ingestion backlog, you know, our, you know, our requirements to re-ingest providers started to um, stack up. We couldn't meet our requirements to re-ingest content on a regular basis. We couldn't ingest larger partners who were giving us 300, 400, 500,000 records. Uh, you know, jobs, when they did succeed, they would take 60, 70, 80, 90 hours to complete. Just a, you know, a real bottleneck and you know, a tremendous amount of time and energy being spent trying to um, lessen the impact of these, of these constraints. So this is the position the team found itself in September 2016. We had a huge backlog of work um, for Ingestion 2 that we could not address because the, the, of the reasons I've already outlined. Uh, that, of course, led to increasing external and internal pressure, both from staff members who needed content to do their jobs as well as partners who we had made a commitment to to regularly re-ingest their content. Um, and then finally, in September 2016, we lost two staff members to uh, other opportunities, and they were our kind of two chief architects who had helped us build Ingestion 2. And we were left with no obvious, low-cost, long-term solution to really address the underlying problems. That is a crisis community. Um, and so in October 2016, um, those of us who were left in the organization kind of put our heads together to really figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to solve this problem? And ultimately decided that there is simply no way of engineering our way out of, out of the constraints of the system in a timely and cost efficient way. And so we had to change direction and we did that in two ways. Uh, the first of which was that we changed our process. Uh, we involved team members both within the, the tech team and the developers as well as across the organization, stakeholders across the organization, librarians, metadata specialists, um, involved like in high level decision making about the project and but you know not necessarily stack selection but in terms of setting priorities. Secondly, we knew that we had to prioritize service over research. Uh, in, with ingestion two there were a number of aspects that were experimental and for which our use case and our institution was the edge case, and so that, of course, leaves us out, you know, kind of exposed. When things don't work for us, there's no one for us to look to, to to help us find our way. Third, we knew we had to work small and fail fast. We did not have the time to sit in a closet and write code for six months or a year before coming out and showing this is what we're working on and this is what we're doing. We had to prove our work both internally and externally along the way 
to show that we knew that we could do it and that you know we could you know garner some trust from outside stakeholders that we knew what we were doing. And lastly, prove the hardest things first. For us at that moment, it was aggregating metadata at scale. Aggregating 500,000 records, you know, was actually quite frankly the lowest threshold. We knew that the National Archives was prepared to dump uh, between eight and 15 million records on us, and if you can't get 400,000 through in less than five days, you know, 10 million ain't gonna fly. So prove the hardest things first. Along that. We recognize that we had to stabilize service to our partners. We only exist because of our member network. And if we can't service their needs and live up to our obligations as a metadata aggregator, we're not doing our jobs. So we made the difficult decision and with buy-in from uh, management and uh, you know, the network as a whole, uh, we began, we essentially abandoned ingestion two and reverted back to the original ingestion system for the people that were both stuck and who were kind of in this limbo state who had not yet been um, brought into our network because we couldn't get them, get them on board. This was an all hands on deck approach. Um, there were a number of staff members who had never worked on the original ingestion system, so we did staff trainings. Uh, we brought in additional staff members to help with uh, quality control and quality analysis uh, who had never done that work before. And from November to January, we went full tilt. And by January, we had cleared our backlog of work. And made an ongoing commitment to support regular re-ingests of metadata through the original ingestion system no matter what. Even though it was using a whole bunch of deprecated technologies and was quite frankly EOL or end of life, you know, a year before, you know, this was our only lifeline, so we knew we had to support it. While we were uh, going through that reversion process, we were also reevaluating our own requirements for what this third iteration of the ingestion system would be. Um, as I said at the outset, our prime, you know, the primary export of the system is to a search index, Elasticsearch, Solar, you know, what have you. So the ingestion system itself doesn't necessarily need to work with RDF natively. If we're only exporting just JSONL, that's all we need to really work with. Also, Sparkle for quality analysis. Uh, there are other ways to do QA, so we don't really, that's no longer a, a real requirement. And then the biggest one was technologies familiar to our community. Uh, back in 2015, you know, 2014, you know, Ruby on Rails and Ruby as a language was kind of in vogue and it was a really kind of common tool to solve a lot of problems. For us, we wanted to look outside of our community. We wanted to see what other tools might be available in different domains um, that might address our use case better than, um, than some of the others that you know, the community itself was, was tapped into. So what were our actual needs? Well, it had to be fast. We've got to be able to re-ingest content quickly um, and you know, grow at scale. Additionally, the, the technology stack that we adopt has to be you know, maybe not mature, but at least stable. You know, we can't be adopting you know, con you know, technologies that might someday work for our use case if we just invest enough time and energy into them. We did not have that time or capacity to, kind of exp to, use, those, um, to use those tools. Additionally, we also recognized the need to do large-scale quality analysis over the entire corpus of records, which at the time was just shy of 20 million records. So where does that land us? Um, we went through a fairly extensive um, uh, landscape survey of technologies that's documented in a wiki um, in my slide notes here. Um, I will make these available if they're not already. Um, I, really encourage you to go and look at that because we looked at a lot of stuff, but where we landed was Apache Spark. Um, Apache Spark is what's called a distributed data processing framework. Uh, at a 30,000 foot view, what that means is with minimal code overhead, I mean next to nothing, you can tap in, you can take a, a job of say mapping or transforming a million records and automatically distribute that work over a number of kind of computers in a cluster or processors, if you've got a multi-core laptop, it'll treat each core as a, as a node in that cluster. And so if you try to map a million records, it'll give, give each node you know, 250,000 records if you've got four nodes in the cluster, and it'll compute that and bring it back for you. Um, I say small data, and by small data, I do mean you know, 30 million records is small data in the world of big data. Um, big data for the museum community is it's too big for open refine. 
So you know, if Excel, if it, you know, your problem's too big for Excel, use OpenRefine. Too big for OpenRefine, use Apache Spark. Um, it's a really fantastic product. Uh, our current director of technology, Michael Delabitta, is the one who uh, uh, turned us on to this to this tech. Um, for his, his background is in big data. The other great thing about Apache Spark, it is supported in a number of different languages. Uh, Scala and Java are both JVM languages, if you're not familiar with Scala. Uh, Python, of course, kind of the lingua franca, you know, and everybody can, you know, write, uh, Greg Albers talk earlier, like Python is the, you know, 30% of what uh, museums write in. R, I'm not familiar with. Um, the other great thing about Apache Spark is you can write SQL natively. And run and run query and run SQL queries against uh, kind of that distributed cluster. So we have a lot of choices. So how do you go about you know picking picking the right path here? Well, we got our hands dirty and we built a bunch of small prototypes in parallel with that reversion process. So I'm going to call out the two rows or three rows here. The top one uh, that was our last successful production ingest using ingestion two. Uh, that is only mapping. So that is 90 hours to map uh, 500,000 records. The next row down, if you simply rip out Marmada and LDP from the process, you shot you bring that down to nine hours. So that's just that's just using the Rails application to write to text files. Um, the rest of these are prototypes that we wrote um, just to kind of get a sense, a feel of like what's it like to work with Spark in this particular language. How does it feel to us as developers? Do we feel comfortable? What is, you know, in addition to performance? The very last one, Spark, Scala, right into sequence files, um, 41 seconds. Uh, so, you know, it's not just about performance. Um, there's an emotional component to software development. We're not machines. If you don't like the tool, if it doesn't feel comfortable, if you don't enjoy using it, don't use it. There are probably other ways to do your work that might not be as performant, but you will enjoy your job a lot more. And so that's something that Michael drilled home to us during stack selection. So we weren't just adding up numbers on a spreadsheet trying to make this decision. There is, there is that emotional, how does this make you feel component to it that we want to acknowledge and recognize from the outset. So what does our stack look like today? We write in Scala, we use Apache Spark, and we persist our data to Amazon S3. We have no database. We write to in immutable files that are rebuilt and recalculated every time we need to, to do a new job. So we don't have any, and so we have no 24 seven running infrastructure to support this. This is all on demand. Oh, I do wanna say, all of these tests were run on MacBook 2015 MacBook Pros. None of these were using a high performance cluster or anything like that. So this is all with you know fairly low end hardware, except for ingestion to production that was on the largest Postgres instance you can buy on Amazon. Um, lastly, um, something that's been really important to us over the last year developing this is recognizing that there is human involvement across the entire ingestion pipeline. Like this is not you know consuming data on one end and outputting data on the other. There are humans that need to be involved and participate in this process, and those people are not developers. They are librarians, they are metadata specialists, they are catalogers, they are people who may have no technical background at the, at the partner level. And so it's, it's important to recognize that when you're building something that feels like you're just running data from one end to the other. Two examples of that. Better alignments of metadata mappings to code. So part of our internal process is I work hand in, you know, very closely with our data services coordinator. And when a new partner comes on board, uh, she looks at their data, their local schema, and writes a metadata mapping in uh, Google Sheets. And we sat down because, you know, previously, you know, where there be conditional mappings, like, you know, for this subject field, you need to split on semicolons or or in order to pull the correct URI, you need to drop the second to the last one. Stuff like that. That was written out in free text in a kind of, you know, kind of a notes field. And myself as the developer would have to you know, make some assumptions and guess about what was happening. And oh, you know, what she's asking for here, the software automatically does over here and she's not aware of it. Well, when we were building this third iteration, we sat down and really walked through the process of 
So I understood what she's thinking through when she's writing the mappings, and she understands the software, at least where things happen in the software, where things could happen in the software. And so we rebuilt her metadata mapping spreadsheet to both better understand, you know, so she can better understand how the software works, and so she can write better map metadata mappings that look more like the code that I need to write. And so up here, uh, this typical normalizations and enrichments, those are universal. Those happen to every record, every time, no matter what. And over on the far, uh, far column, that's custom. So for the California Digital Library, we need to split their subjects on semicolons. And if you look down here at the code, you know, a non-developer can look at that and compare the spreadsheet to the code and say, yeah, you got it exactly right. It's very, like, we, and we worked very hard to establish a vocabulary defining what each one of these operations means, and it, like, we reduced the development cycles where it might take three or four cycles to get the mapping right. Now we're down to one, maybe two cycles before we've, you know, ironed out, you know, all the issues. The second, uh, and I apologize um, if this is uh, a little bit hard to read, um, logs are really useful. Um, it's important to get useful information out of them, both from a developer's perspective and when it comes to mapping metadata uh, from the uh, metadata specialist from the librarian's perspective. And so we really made this kind of a first order priority. And so, you know, typically in previous iterations of, of our system, when something blew up, it would be written out in a stack trace and you would have no idea what record failed specifically for what reason or like what the underlying data was. And so you kind of got to like look at the stack trace, go back and try, it just, you know, made things really hard to understand. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand, you know, what's useful to get back from the data provider's perspective from our own internal, for our own internal quality analysis and quality control perspectives. And again, you, with Apache Spark, it's really easy to recompute and to like do a lot of qualitative analysis over a large corpus of records. It doesn't take a lot of time. And so, you know, this is taking three minutes to map, uh, you know, a half million records. And obviously our prototypes in our production system are not apples to apples, but, and you know, a lot of this error reporting is not optimized, but still to get this level of granularity and this level of detail in three minutes, works for us. And so in addition to knowing uh, how many records failed, um, you know, we have two records that failed for because they're missing the required field. Each one of these lines corresponds to a CSV file. In that CSV file, you have the DPLA identifier, the local identifier, and the problematic value if one exists. Obviously, if you're missing data, no, no data. Um, and then additionally, for all of the warnings, they correspond to CSV files as well. So if uh, an institution is interested in prioritizing a data cleanup project to fill in, you know, subject because, you know, when we're looking at our Google Analytics, things that have, you know, complete or a lot of subject values tend to get surfaced more in search results. Um, it, it helps them prioritize that because they know specifically what records are missing those values. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're, you know, this, uh, an Excel file of 521,000 rows isn't super helpful, but, you know, more information is better than no information. Uh, we didn't do this alone over the last year. We have tried to build and, you know, uh, had a community, particularly in the library technology community, kind of uh, 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 come along with us in this way. Uh, so I would specifically point you to this group, uh, uh, Code for Lib, as uh, the larger umbrella organization, library technologists. Uh, Spark in the Dark is our big data uh, kind of subgroup within that. Uh, if you're doing anything related to uh, data processing or have something to show, we love show and tell, so uh, join us and let us know what you want to share. Uh, if you have questions about DPLA technology generally, uh, DPLA Tech has a Slack group. Uh, and these last three bullets are resources that we found like instrumental in trying to learn this because this is all new to me over the last year um, and these have all been tremendous resources. So uh, uh, happy to share those. Um, lastly, I would not be here uh, without these people. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Questions? So um, it sounds like the main kind of bottleneck that you 
removed to get on that speed up was the, the triple store aspect. Did, did you consider, did you look at other triple stores? Did you ever consider going back to that model or for the moment are you pretty stuck with? We looked with great, we looked at Blaze Graph and some other triple stores. And again, there are like, there are links to wikis that we like that literally um, our senior or our former senior developer, Mark Breedlove, like triaged all of this. Like he tried to wring blood from a stone um, over the summer, and you know, fundamentally, you know, I think there were some fairly specific approaches to how Cree approached this problem that made things a little difficult to change, and it became a point of like, how much is this going to cost us to try and fix it versus you know we have like this now immediate problem of service to our providers that we need, and so we just. We never felt comfortable that we would truly be able to solve that scale problem well enough, especially you know with you know Nara breathing down our necks with you know 15, 20 million records, and I mean I think we have eventually a growth target of like 100 million in the corpus. So yeah, we it was certainly a consideration, but we kind of reached a breaking point, particularly with the staff departures that we just felt no. But again, there are links in there to those wiki pages, and you know that the. Yeah, the, the writing is on the on those. So, anybody else? Is that something you'd feel comfortable about if we invoke the Chatham House rules? Um, find me after. Sure. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, today, uh, uh, today is a rough. Like, um, we lost six yeah. half people today. So, yeah, it's a rough day. Um, so there, was there one other question right behind you? I'm sorry. I'm not clear on what. Oh, yeah, uh, that is a perfect question. Um, so the Digital Public Library of America um, is a national metadata aggregator in the United States, for the United States. So we aggregate library, museum, uh, and archival content in repositories uh, throughout our member network. So we have about 40 partners, um, ranging from large institutions from the National Archive, the Smithsonian, Library of Congress, NYPL, to state level hubs, um, like the state of Ohio has a hub, and they have a, a, a network of contributing institutions. And so, like the, the Hamilton County Historical Society will feed data up to the state of Ohio aggregator, and then we will pick it up from them. And so we act as, um, not as an endpoint, but our goal is to kind of drive, is to create visibility for that content and then drive it back to the originating repositories and institutions. So that's our kind of aggregator mission. We are also uh, really active in the ebooks and open ebooks ecosystems. Uh, we uh, used to produce a lot of online educational content, including online exhibitions, primary source sets, and uh, curricula for primary school educators. Um, we don't do that third component quite you know anymore, but the resources are still available on our website. Um, and your question is quite frankly, more existential uh, at the moment because we are in the midst of a strategic planning uh, session. So uh, we are kind of emerging out of that initial startup growth period of five years. And um, yeah, so that's that's us in a nutshell, but yeah. Anybody else? In moving from the, you know, first moving to the RDF, No, I don't think that we're losing. Sorry, I'm going to step back to the microphone. I don't think that we're losing anything. Um, I am not a, a modeler, um, and you know the, the the person that would be best positioned to answer that question. I don't think that it's. In fact, I think you know, in, in certain respects, like what we've done with ingestion three has actually made it a lot more flexible because we can, like, we just did a model update last week. And we did it in such a way that we can simply, we didn't have to reprocess the entire data set to make that update. But we could have, if it was like, if it was a breaking change, we can simply recompute all of the data on the fly. Like it doesn't take us, it'll take, take us like a day and a half to essentially remap the entire data set and re reconstruct the entire thing and, you know, and update our search index. 
you know, so in that sense, you know, I think it is, it certainly gives us more flexibility in that regard. And uh, there's a lot of hand waving here, but you know, should the time come, we can, re we can construct, we can serialize that data as RDF, as turtle, like the output format, you know, we can be agnostic about so long as we have the, you know, the data files sitting on S3 and the tool and the technology to, to do that. So, you know, I think that's where we have a little bit more flexibility. Sorry, one more question. Yeah, so you, uh, your mapping, so it looks like your mapping is all defined as code, is that correct? Yeah. Have you, have you considered or is it on the timeline somewhere thought about making that into something, so you're saying you're taking from spreadsheets and make that into readable code, would you ever consider making that into more of a config file type thing so that the people writing the mapping could just write the mapping directly and give that to you? Yeah, I think we'd, I think we'd consider that. I mean, I should actually, uh, if, like after this, if I can pull up you know, some of our mappings, like they are pretty simple. Like they're like really, you know, I wouldn't take a Scala developer to sit down and actually write them because it's like literally, extract strings like we put we put a lot of like English wrapping around you know around some of these underlying functions again to make it far more human readable um, and we do have a lot of you know you know config file you know we do have like a lot of you know configuration stuff sitting outside of the code base but you know uh, at this point um, if you were to look at the mappings for ingestion one ingestion two and ingestion three for a given provider yeah I think we're certainly <laughs> in the right direction I actually don't know if there's another presentation behind me. I didn't see anyone trying to pull me off the stage, but honestly, I don't know. So I'm happy to address other questions asynchronously. That's my email address. Um, yeah, thank you. Cheers. record set with a certain scale, totally performant, no issues whatsoever. But once we hit like a million, 1.5 million records in the triple store, which is of course, you know, billions of triples, and you know, all of those, you know, you know, we just, and part of the problem is that Marmada did not support, one of the problems is that Marmada does not support distributed Postgres. So you have a single Postgres instance, and so if you have multiple jobs, you can't, like you literally couldn't run multiple jobs because you've got so many things hitting that and that's what I mean, is like, they were like in there, like literally, you know, tuning the query and the underlying query and trying to optimize it for specific cases. And all of that's documented in the piece. Um, it's all publicly available. So like, you know, we kind of, it's like, yeah, we, we didn't kind of just like roll our sleeves and like roll our eyes and give up. Like this was, there was a lot that went into trying to, to support and maintain that for a long time. But you know, ultimately, you know, we were just an edge case. Like we were frightened
excited to see all of this work. Also, I'm following some of the data stuff about what happens at scale. Um, it's really fascinating. 